do you think the royal family knows more than they're led to believe? Oh, I feel certain they do. Um, yes, I. Again, we would need another program. Perhaps we should now <laughs> to go into some of this because I've, you know, I've I've sat with some people that are, you know, involved with the royals over a glass of whiskey. It's surprising what you get to hear once uh, sure. the drink has flowed a little bit. Yep. Yes, uh, th there is no doubt. I, I mean, I think I can say this, that it kind of brings in a bit of an insight to some of this. Um, I, I, I won't mention names. In fact, um, I was only ever given a code, so I don't know the name. But um, I did a presentation. This is going back uh, about 13 years, I think, 13 or 14 years in England. And I, and I won't say where because, you know, it just keeps the, the information here. I did it. It was a public presentation. It was quite a, quite a size and, you know, quite a big one. And at the end, uh, a person came up to me, um, I would say about a 55, 60 year old person, and asked if I would uh, kind of just walk outside somewhere quiet and they wanted to talk to me about something. I could see this person was not your. Well, my judgment was that this is a person who's come to see me, not to so much listen to what I just had to say, but this person's got something they really truly want to say. I, there was that kind of air about it. And so I, I went outside, and uh, it was very obvious that this person was absolutely afraid to be seen in my presence, but needed me to know something. And I arranged a meeting. I was given a code structure, and it was because this person was v very deeply involved in the royal family, and um, we set a meeting up, and uh, it was very intricate. It had to be set up in such a way that they could convey to me this information without being known or seen by the royals. And um, it was just an extraordinary situation. I, the information I was given um, was uh, pretty extraordinary, and it, it related to Prince Charles in particular, who has had many UFO experiences, and, uh, is that right? Close. Yeah, absolutely. I did not know it's, that. No, it, I don't think it's public knowledge. Uh, it, it's clearly the, per the pain this person was going through to tell me. And the reason that I was told that this person was breaking some ground, to put it into the public side, that somebody out there out on the outside world should know about it, is that, I'm going to say she, it was a she, um, was with Prince Charles and a number of other people that we don't know, but they were royals in, down the chain a little bit, very close to where I lived, uh, very close. And this extremely large craft came over the town and, of, of about 35,000 people. Um, that, I know this place very well, by the way, in England. And there was a very low-level rumbling uh, just that deep rumbling sound. The ground was vibrating. It came up and it swiveled like it was described to me as a radiator, like an oblong radiator with these flutes, these heating flutes mm -hmm. down like a radiator has, radiator panel, panels. This was a very, very dark color. It rotated over the town, cantilevered in front of Charles. They, these people were jumping on, diving under the hedges. This thing was so big. She said to me, that if this thing ever decided to land, it could take an entire town with it. And she said, you know, it terrified everybody concerned. And she went on to tell me that Charles himself, and uh, who knows, Mel, somebody in the royal household could be listening to this now. Um, I have had my contacts, and I still have back door if they're wanting at any point to convey more on this. Um, we, there's, we don't need to go further in public than it ever needs to go. But the, the thing about it was that Charles himself, seems like many abductees do, uh, seem to have uh, some tagging of some sort, that there is a reason why, which we don't understand, why an extraterrestrial species returns time and time again. Um, he, he certainly, in the royal family, does seem to be the person that uh, an interest is shown in. Uh, I was told, uh, that, uh, again, this senior person within the royal family um, was aware of uh, a particular place that I'm, I, I know myself, uh, I can't say, where he visits quite regularly. Um, the orbs, these orbs that we're, mm -hmm. we're seeing and hearing so much about these days, 
uh, have arrived for years around him. And whilst he would be inside the building, they would kind of be like rotating around a certain shrub. It was always the same shrub in the front yard of this this house, uh, large house that he that he visits. And, you know, it was like it was its place to be waiting uh, and before he came out. He's had one particular uh, encounter with an extraterrestrial uh, himself. Um, it was described to me in some detail. Uh, I it was absolutely sworn that no detail with any name should ever be put out, and I've never done so. This is the most I've ever said about it on on any media. Um, and of course, you know, as much as I like you and your program, it would not be uh, it would not be sensible or fair to the person who went to great pains to get this out into the public uh, sector uh, to, de to declare any more than that. Dates, times, and other names wouldn't be very helpful to anybody and I think would actually endanger this person. I, uh, one of my meetings with, with her, um, I can say now because my mum and dad have both passed away, but um, one of these meetings was arranged in my parents' home and uh, she was taken there, um, she got herself there through a, a route that you know we had not planned. I, she was the only one that knew it so that she wasn't followed there. And uh, whilst she was with me, uh, my father came into the room and tapped the door and, you know, because they had left us, of course, alone throughout the meeting, but came in to say that there was a vehicle on the other side of the road with about 20 aerials on it, blacked out windows, was clearly putting a, a, a dish antenna focused right in our window. Hmm. So it is very likely that whilst she thought that she was had not been followed and... Um, she was. By the mid-1980s, Dale Kanga Tryon seemed to have secured her place in the bosom of the royal family. With Diana as an ally against Camilla, Dale was once again back in Prince Charles's inner circle. For Camilla, the discreet waiting game continued out of the public eye. He says, Dale is the only woman who ever understood me. This, of course, is very undermining to Camilla, who is determined that she will keep hold of him at all costs. And at this stage, you have this unspoken but incredibly bitter rivalry between these two women for the heart and soul of the Prince of Wales. Dale had even become a regular riding companion of the Queen. She rode with the Queen every October because they went to Balmoral. They had, I think, a standing invitation, and the Queen enjoyed her company. But Dale's love of the limelight was becoming an embarrassment, as she exploited her royal connections ever more publicly, even appearing on quiz shows. How should you formally address the Earl of Chester? Sorry. Kanga, yes. Well, he's, um, Lord... No, he isn't. You should address uh, the Earl of Chester as your Royal Highness, because the Earl of Chester is... Oh. Prince Charles. I think that turned Charles slightly against her in that she became too showy, too, too flamboyant, totally in contrast to Camilla, who was sitting in a farmhouse, going hunting three days a week and, and not doing much else. As Charles's marriage failed, he turned not to Dale, but to the ever-discreet Camilla. Dale's years spent courting journalists backfired. In 1987, tabloids reported that Charles was having an affair with her. At the time, and still today, the Tryon family denied the claims, saying that to the best of their knowledge, Dale was a good friend of the prince, but not his mistress. Lord Tryon specifically denied the claim in print. Well, I just feel it's unnecessary that he had to sort of go to those lengths. It was very difficult, um, because, you know, one wanted to stand up and say, don't be so ridiculous. But it's very difficult to ignore, you know, if you've got people camping on your doorstep, you know, which I did have for three weeks. Um, and people climbing up trees and with telescopic lenses taking pictures through the window. I mean, it does get tedious. Much of the press speculation centred on letters Prince Charles was supposed to have written to Dale. What about the letters he's written you? Well... What letters? Oh, I thought there were some letters that he's written to you over the years. Well, your friends probably write to you, but... Will you ever let your children or grandchildren read them? 
I just don't want to discuss them, Michael. Dale's love of media attention had finally cost her Prince Charles's friendship. His marriage officially ended, and as Diana was forced out of the picture, so too was her ally. Ending months of speculation, the Prince and Princess of Wales are to separate. Buckingham Palace said the decision was reached amicably, and the couple have no plans for divorce. Discreet Camilla had played the long game, and slowly but surely she and Charles openly became a couple. What seems to have broken Dale's spirit is learning that Camilla was back on the scene when his uh, relationship with Diana um, went wrong. And I think she would have wanted to be back on the scene herself, but wasn't. Dale was left out in the cold, and Camilla's innate understanding of the rules had got her her man. And now, at her lowest ebb, Dale suffered a double blow. First, the reoccurrence of a childhood illness, spina bifida, that had crippled her until the age of nine. I went in to do the big fashion fair and was feeling fine. Went to get up out of the chair and I just couldn't walk. As so, as, that. as sudden as that. As she recovered and learned to walk again, doctors discovered a much more serious problem. And I just, I was in the same consulting rooms and just got the all clear to say I could swim, play tennis, ride, yep. you know. And I walked out that door and into the next door to be told I had cancer. I really just felt I'd blow. I mean, this is just such a bore. I've just got over Beaches Brook and now I'm mm. going to have to go, go right over again. it again. Despite her outward determination to get well, mentally Dale was finding it harder and harder to cope. I think a divide came in her personality in the early 90s when things started to go wrong. I think she could see that the magic journey, which had started in Melbourne all those years ago and had veered via royal palaces, could be coming to an end. And I think at that point her personality split and that you still saw that positive, bubbly, vibrant kanga on occasions. But you could now glimpse another person, Dale Tryon, dark thoughts crowding in on her at the thought that her life may not run its course. Following a gruelling bout of treatments, Dale took herself off on a spiritual retreat to the Himalayas with the actress Sarah Miles. She certainly changed a lot, I think, in the Himalayas. I think she wanted to get rid of her cancer and thought that you can get rid of it by sort of spiritual means. And I think that she, she'd tried all the drugs and they weren't working, so she thought that lugging me along uh, would help her and also um, meeting as many spiritual people along the way that could help her to find this, this inner, inner, inner peace that she was looking for. On her return, Dale immediately checked herself into a rehab clinic. The move was a surprise to all but her closest friends. She said that she was full of these drugs from the cancer that, and she felt that it was a cleansing and that she'd come out feeling completely new because she was healed and her whole new life would start when she came out of farm place. But events were about to take a strange and mysterious turn. On the 31st of May, 1996, 48-year-old Dale Tryon fell from a window at the clinic and broke her back. I got this, this phone call, a message on my answering machine. The message said, literally, Kanga has fallen out of a window. And this was the most extraordinary news, because I thought to myself that I was driving toward her. How do you fall out of a window? I've never understood how you fall out of windows. When I arrived, she was like, she was just swathed in bandages, like a cocoon. And it was one of the saddest sights I've ever seen. Her little face poking out, and then she came to. And um, she focused in on me, and she said, Sir, I was pushed. And then she sort of fell back into sleep. Because she said it coming out of sleep, do you actually lie the moment you, you come out of sleep? Well, anyhow, she obviously must have done, because I went and told Lord Tryon what had just happened. 
He said, oh, absolute nonsense, absolute nonsense. And of course it was nonsense. So he said, Sarah, would you come to lunch on Thursday? I said, why? He said, I'd just like you to meet some friends. I said, of course. So I came to lunch that, that Thursday, and, and there was 12 people around this very large table. There were some lawyers. There were a couple of nurses, and everybody to do with Kanga being in farm place. And, and they all categorically tell me that it was absolute nonsense and that she had jumped out the window. I thanked them all very much for letting me know all this, and I drove home thinking, my, what a very, you know, what an elegant man he is to, to put my mind at rest with so many people present. I thought that was very, very charming. To this day, Farm Place Clinic will not comment on the fall. But Dale's own daughter refuted her mother's allegations. She definitely did jump from the window. I spoke to a woman who was there beneath the window um, who placed cushions underneath her and tried to talk her out of it. And they did everything they could to stop her from, from jumping, but it happened. I don't jump out of windows, and I've got a terrible claustrophobia of heights. No, I don't jump out windows. Because she has changed a great deal, and it's just very sad because... I just don't understand, you know, where a lot of her theories come from, what, the way her mind works. Dale's family say that she suffered from alcoholism and recurrent depression, which led her to try to take her own life. The months after the fall were extremely difficult for her family, as her mental state worsened. Dale also faced an uphill struggle. Not only had she broken her back, but she had also fractured her skull, and for the third time in her life she set about learning to walk. She used to say, Dr. Ali, you must make me walk again. I said, I'll do my best. She's, and uh, she used to insist that I said yes. <laughs> Sarah. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Oh, <laughs> much better for seeing you. <laughs> we started doing the treatment and very slowly some of the movements were coming back. Then after a few months, there came a stage where she was able to uh, sort of bend her legs and dig her heels into the bed and uh, sort of move it a little bit. Fantastic, kangaroo!